I'm excited to talk about what God has put on my heart for you. God has given me a word for you. And uh, I'm really excited because we are continuing our series, We Want to See Jesus. And this is a particularly great season. This is actually the last season of this series. We're in the uh, I Am's section. And I really love this section of this series and the book of John because basically what Jesus tells us in the book of John when he talks about the I am's is he says, when you look at me, this is what you're going to see. If you want to know who I am, Jesus says, I am. So last week we discovered that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He sustains us. And today we're going to look at another amazing I am statement. And uh, we're going to look at it in John chapter 8. And let's read it together. It'll be on your screen. We're going to start in verse 12. It says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus told them, these claims are valid, even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. But you don't know this about me. I love this. This is basically the Bible version of, you don't know me. Disciples, hold me back. Hold. His disciples are like, Jesus, Jesus. He says, you judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, Jesus says, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I'm not alone. The father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness, and my father who sent me is the other. Where's your father, they asked. Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, <laughs> you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you would also know my father. I love that. I am the light of the world, and those who follow me do not have to walk in darkness. There was uh, several years ago, actually a long time ago, when I was about 17 or 18, around then, um, I actually got into a series of accidents, really bad car accidents. And uh, the first one was, I believe I was 17 or 18, and it wasn't my car, it was my brother's car. It was a white Ford Explorer, 97 or something like that. And uh, basically what happened was I, I tried to make a U-turn from a parked position. So I was parked, I tried to U-turn, and as I was turning, someone T-boned me. They hit my, my uh, driver's side door going about 40 miles an hour. My car went up in the air and then it came back down. And I walked away without a scratch. As a matter of fact, so did everybody in the other car. They were all totally fine. They were so fine that the woman driving was able to get out of the car and start screaming at me. And I remember, I remember that at the time I was listening to John Mayer. And it was just, the only reason I remember that is because her screaming while John Mayer was playing um, kept, me, kept me calm. My brother's car. Sorry, Aaron. The second car that I totaled was about a year later, and it was my mom's Chrysler LHS, her brand new Chrysler LHS. And actually, as I was, uh, as I was trying to remember the details of this story, I, I, I called my mom and I asked her, hey, you know, what was, the, what was the model of that car? And she told me, and she threw in there, I loved that car. So it still stings, I guess, a little bit for her. Well, my parents were out of town, 
and uh, I was driving her car, and I decided that it would be a great idea to go pick up my ex-girlfriend. Um, that's another story for another time. And uh, of course, while she was in the car, it had just rained, it was first rain, and I was driving around a, a windy road, and uh, it was a two-way road, and there was another car coming the opposite direction, and they were a little bit too close to the, to the middle line, uh, a little too close for my comfort, so I, I overcorrected, and I spun out, and I rammed the car into a boulder. Again, I was totally fine. She was totally fine. My parents were out of town, so of course, uh, my ex-girlfriend's gigantic dad had to come pick us up. And, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll, maybe someday I'll share more about that story. But about a year exactly later, I was driving <laughs> in my car. Uh, I, think, I think after that, probably I, <laughs> the next time I asked my parents if I could borrow their car, they were like, ah, oh, let's get you your own car. And um, so they got me a Saturn SL, and I was driving that car, and I was driving it uh, somewhere around Soquel, which uh, they're windy kind of mountain roads. And it was getting dark, and sure enough, I got lost. And of course, as it would happen, that as it was getting dark, and I didn't know where I was going, my low fuel light came on. And for some, I mean, I don't know why. I, was, I just started thinking about the fact that that I had just wrecked a car a year before, and I kind of started freaking out a little bit. I started, I started getting panicky. I started thinking, you know, I'm sure that at some point my car is going to stop because I don't have any more fuel, and then what's going to happen is another car is going to, like, zoom around one of, these, one of these turns and just, like, smash right into me, and I, I was panicking. After a little bit of time where I was just kind of like, in my head and, and, and my mind was going 100 miles an hour, I, I remembered to slow myself down and ask God for help. And that's what I did. I said, God, I need your help. And it probably wasn't 30 seconds after I prayed that, that as I was driving along, I saw from around the corner, hitting the trees next to, next to the road, red and blue flashing lights. And of course, I, I turn the corner and sitting on the side of the road is a park ranger. And she's just, her truck is, is parked on the side of the road and she's standing outside of her truck as if she was waiting for me. And so I was so relieved because this whole time I didn't see any cars on that road. I thought I found some remote, like, like leading to nowhere road. So I pulled up to her. I rolled my window down. I was so happy to see her. And I said, hey, I'm lost. I don't know how to get back to where I need to go. And I remember she smiled. And she said, that happens. She said, follow me. I'll take you back to where you need to be. She jumped in her truck. And I followed her back until I knew where I was. Seeing the light from that ranger's truck has stuck with me all these years, and I think about it every once in a while. Because it wasn't just that I saw light. Any light source, like from, a, from the moon or from some street light or, or, or some other random car, no, the light that I saw was from the person that I needed to find in order to get back to where I needed to be. The light that could lead me back to safety. In John chapter eight, Jesus reveals himself as the light that leads to life. Not just any light, but the light that leads us back to where we need to be. Right now, life probably, for you as well as me, seems pretty dark, okay? Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of a crazy cultural year. We're dealing with, we're dealing with uh, fires. We're dealing with what seems like the end of the world. 
And on top of that, many of us are unemployed or we don't know how our business is going to make it or we don't know how we're supposed to guide our kids through, through basically homeschool when I'm not a teacher, but now I'm a teacher for my six-year-old. So it can feel pretty hopeless at times. It can feel pretty confusing at times. It can feel like you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. And our default sometimes when we're in crisis can be to look at our circumstance through our natural eyes. But what if we could look at our life and see beyond the surface? What if we could see deeper? What if it wasn't just that when we walked into a room or woke up and walked into our day that we just saw whatever was naturally around us? What if there was a light that didn't just light up the surface? But what if there was a light that illuminated beyond the surface, helped us to see in the spiritual? If we could see deeper and if we could know beyond just our own thoughts and our own emotions and our own perspective of what's happening around us, that would be pretty helpful. Actually, we can. We can see deeper, and we do have that light. His name is Jesus. And he is not just any light. When he says that he's the light of the world, he's not just talking about a light that illuminates surfaces. He is the most powerful light that there is. He can light up where you think that there's no way that you can get out of this confusion. There's no way that you can get through this crisis. There's no way that you can know what's in front of you. Jesus can light up your light. And the power of this light is such that if we surrender to it, that it could change every aspect of our lives. It's not just, it's not just like when you walk into a dark room and you flip the switch. It's like when you walk into a dark year and you surrender to Jesus and you say, the only way that I'm gonna get through this is by tapping into the light of the world. Let's talk a little bit about this power of the light. I wanna give you guys three things and I honestly don't know how closely I'm gonna to stick to these notes because, because there's, I, I just have so much, so much in my heart and in my mind that we'll see. The power of this light in our lives. Let me give you three, let me give you three things that this light does for our life. Number one, this light illuminates. This light tells us where to go. Christian, how many times have you, have you looked at the next month of your life or you looked at the next year of your life? Maybe you've looked at a big decision that's coming up. You've looked at a crisis that's in front of you and you thought, man, I, I do want to do the will of God. God, I, I wanna do whatever you're asking me to do, but I just don't know what that step is. And, and I, know that, I know that many of us have, have said, God, if you'll just give me like the answer, if you'll just give me like the next five steps, I'll do them exactly the way that you tell me to do them. I want to follow you. And, and also, God, could you like, could you give me the answer like a month before I need to make the decision? Like, could we not wait till the very last second before I hear your voice and I know where to move? But the problem with that is that that's oftentimes not the way that God operates. See, I've learned that, that when we come to a decision or when we come to an uncertain time, that the reason that God doesn't give us the next month of our lives or the, next, the plan for the next year of our lives or the next five years of our lives is because he wants us to stay close to his word. And he knows that if he gives us everything that we need for the next year of our life, well, we'll probably spend the rest of that year just doing what we need to do and we won't talk to God. Why would we open up our word if we knew exactly what we needed to do? 
Why would we pray if we already had the answers? See, it's kind of like in a marriage. It's like, it's like if, if in the beginning of your marriage, you tell your wife that you love her and you have that honeymoon stage where you're super close and super affectionate and you, you know, do all these things for your wife. And then, and then you say, okay, well, well, I've expressed to you how much I love you and I know that we're married so I'm not gonna tell you I love you anymore. I don't need to spend time with you anymore. I don't need to, that's not the way it works. In order to be close to God, the way relationships work is that every day you're close to God. Every day you express to God that you love him. Every day you express to God that you need him. Every day you get close to his word. Every day you worship him. We can't go a year without telling God how much we love him, without showing him our dedication to him. So God only reveals a little bit at a time to us by us staying close to his word so that we can see what's right in front of us. Psalm 119 expresses this beautifully. It says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. For my feet, for my path what I'm supposed to be doing today. 106 says, I've promised it once and I'll promise it again. I will obey your righteous regulations. God is saying to us, listen to what I'm saying and I will keep you and I will light up your path. I will make sure that you know what's in front of you. This light illuminates. Number two, this light comforts us. You know, the light of the world, the power of Jesus, a relationship with him, it doesn't just take care of the insane, the crisis, the big things. But God also wants to be in our lives to comfort us. You know, when, when it's dark, like on that road that I was on, when I saw that light, I was instantly comforted. I instantly had hope. Jesus is so powerful and so big that sometimes we can forget to involve him in our day-to-day lives. Like, have you ever felt like God was too busy? So maybe I shouldn't bother him with, with issues that that I don't think are that big of a deal. Sometimes we're not going through anything too crazy, but but maybe you just kind of feel like, maybe you just have a day where you feel sad or you just are going through a time of feeling lonely. Maybe you're just kind of discouraged. Maybe you just feel that darkness. But God is saying, I don't want to just be around for the big issues. I don't want just to be your emergency panic button. I want to sit with you. I want to comfort you. I want to be with you. You don't even have to say anything. You know, uh, for for me and my wife, April, she she loves conversation. Conversation is is a very big thing for her. And she wants me to talk. She wants to hear about my day. She wants to hear about conversations that I've had. And... And she wants me to open up. And that's when we're together, she wants me to open up. And uh, for me, I love talking to my wife, but I also love those moments where I just, I just get to sit with her and be with her. I just get to, you know, maybe she's sitting on the couch next to me and we're both on our phones. Or we're watching something on TV or, or she's, we're doing different things, but, but as long as we're just together. So, so there will be some times where I'll be sitting, I'll be sitting down, and April uh, loves getting things done. So she'll she'll oftentimes be around the house doing something, um, making something happen, doing something with Chloe, keeping her occupied, making sure that the house isn't on fire, you know. And I'm just I'm just relaxed on the couch. So sometimes what I'll I'll like yell to her and I'll say, Hey, April, just come sit with me. And so April will come and she'll sit down and she'll look at me like, 
guess. Like she's, <laughs> and I, I'll say to her, April, I, I don't have anything to say. I just, want, I just want us to sit. I just want us to sit. I don't have anything on my mind. I just want to sit with you. Just her being there gives me comfort and strength. Like her being, her presence is restful to me. And it's the same with God's presence. God's presence is not just there to get things done. You understand that God wants to rest with us. God's light wants to comfort us. He wants us to to be at peace with him. Maybe you've been going through life and just trying to get things done and maybe you've been trying to handle everything on your own. But when is the last time you just sat in God's presence and let him comfort you? You didn't have a list of things for him to do. You didn't have, you didn't have a, bunch of, a bunch of crises that you needed to, to pray through. Just sit in his presence and let the light that leads to life comfort you. This light comforts us. Another thing that this light does that I'm, that I'm kind of getting right now is just like the whole theme of this service is that this light leads to revival. This light is not a light just for our house. This light is not just a light for us to be able to see what's in front of us. But this is actually a light that is meant for the world. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the light of the world. I am here to light up the dark places. I'm here to visit the people who don't yet know me. I'm here to set the captives free. If you know Jesus, you're free. If you know Jesus, you're in the light. Maybe it doesn't feel like it all the times, but can you imagine if you and I know Jesus and sometimes we feel like we're in the darkness, how much darker must it feel for the lost ones who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who are just out there with their lighters trying to find where they're supposed to be? The light of the world the light of the world. This is what revival looks like. This is what revival sounds like. You think the world is dark right now, but I want you to know, Christian, follower of Jesus, that God is at work. You can't see it because again, you and I, we look at the surface, but Jesus is lighting up the globe right now. He is reaching people. He is reaching people. Because you know when we start to really appreciate light? When it feels dark. When we've been sitting in it for a little bit. When we've been sitting in it. So, so this, this is the moment of revival right here. You say, why is this happening? Why is the world like this? Why is all this craziness going on? God, aren't you, aren't you there? Don't you care about what's happening? Why, why are you letting the light, the, the world be so dark? He says, the reason that I'm doing that is because when people have sat in darkness, a little flicker of light, will draw them in. God is doing something in the world. We've been praying for revival to come, but I believe that revival is happening right now. Right now. We're in the middle of it. And we need the light of the world to see beyond the surface, to illuminate even deeper. The last point that I'll give is that the light of the world, Jesus, sets us free. I want to remind you today that you don't have to free yourself by yourself. That that darkness you're facing, that emptiness, that struggle, the addiction, the loneliness or hopelessness, that trauma 
that happened to you years ago that you've just been having to deal with and you feel like you've been carrying it for years and years, dragging it behind you. God wants to set you free. You're not alone. And sometimes you think you're alone because it feels dark around you. But I want you to know, and God wants you to know, that he wants to work with you to set you free. When I was lost on that road, I wasn't lost because that was a never-ending road. I had found the only never-ending road. I wasn't lost on that road because I was the worst driver in the world and I was hopeless and I should just pull over on the side of the road and give up now. I simply didn't know the way. When you're lost, you can feel trapped. But you're not trapped. You might have just gotten lost. But when you invite that light into your life, Jesus will set you free. John 8, 31, 32 says this. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Even as believers, we have to keep discovering truth. When you get saved, it's not like you're instantly free in every area of your life. We have to know the word of God. We have to know the word of God. God wants us to get close to his word. He wants us to get close to good counsel that is based in his truth. We have to get close to him, close to his people, close to people who are carriers of the light. And I feel like some of you listening might be thinking, man, the last thing I want in the world right now is to see the light of God. Maybe you're running from God. Maybe you're mad at God. Or maybe maybe you're afraid that if if the light of, of God touches your life, he'll expose some things and he won't be happy with you. Like he'll he'll be disappointed with you or you'll be in trouble. I remember uh, one final story. I remember uh, being, being a young man. I was a teenager and I was in high school and I was, of course, living with my parents. And they had, I can't remember what it was, uh, if it was like a certain time at night that I had to be home or if it was, you know, uh, but, I, but I knew, you know, maybe they didn't have a hard time, like a hard set time, but I knew, you know, midnight, one, you know what I mean? Like you get, you're just out when you're, when you're a kid and you're out and you start looking at your, looking at the time and you're just, you, you just know, you feel it. Oh, this is too late. I can just feel it. Um, so, <laughs> so if I would be out past the time that I was supposed to be, I did what every young person across America tries to do. I would try to sneak into my bedroom. And uh, the problem with that is, is that we lived in a, in a two-story house and the stairs, sometimes some of the stairs were like a little squeaky, you know. And my parents' bedroom was at the top of the stairs. And what my parents would do is they would go to sleep but they would leave the bedroom door open. They would leave their bedroom door open so that they could hear me come in. And like, I totally get it because when your kid is out at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, you, as a parent, you just wanna know that your kid's okay. And you wanna give them like a little freedom. You don't wanna be like that parent that's like texting every five minutes, where are you, you know, da, 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 uh, you know. Uh, but you still, you wanna know, okay, they're home. You know, maybe I was half asleep. Now I can really go to sleep. So, so their bedroom door was at the top of the stairs. They would leave their bedroom door open. So, so I could see from the top of the stairs, uh, I could see my, my parents' feet under their, under their blanket. And of course their bedroom light was turned off. So what I would do is I would walk up the stairs and I would time my steps with snores and then I'd wait. And sometimes it wasn't like snoring every, it was, sometimes it was, 
you know, minutes between snores. And I'd hear it. And I'd slowly, so, so here was the goal. Here's what I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see my parents' bedroom light turn on because then I knew that I had been caught. And I'd get past their, you know, and I'm sure they knew. I'm sure they knew. They, I don't think they ever said, hey, you know, we heard you. But actually, if, if you're a smart parent, you don't say that. You just let them think they got, and you go, okay, I, I got you. But the truth is, if you're running from God, you're not in trouble with God. If you're thinking he's mad at you, that's not his perspective. He wants you to come home. Sometimes the relief of a parent for their kid coming home is so much greater than their need to, to come down on them. God would rather you come home. So if you're listening to this right now, if you found yourself while I'm talking, just kind of going, you know what, that, that's me. I'm running from God. I've stayed out way too late and I'm afraid to come home. God says, that's not what I want you to worry about. God says, I just, I just want you to be safe and home. So I wanna encourage you right now that if you've, if you've been far from God, maybe, maybe, um, maybe at one point you were close to God, but you just got caught up doing the wrong things. You got into a cycle and, and you're afraid. I want to encourage you to right now make a decision. God, I'm coming back to you today. I'm coming back to you today. I don't want to do those things anymore. Maybe, maybe you're listening to this and you're, and you're thinking, I've never had a relationship with Jesus. You know what? God wants you to come home too. God loves you. He cares for you. He died for your sins and for my sins. And he did that not so we could be out in the world, out in the dark, by ourselves, confused, concerned, scared. He said, look, I've paid the price for you to come home. I just want you to, in your heart, say, say between you and God, God, I want to come home. You can say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being far from you. God, I repent of everything that I've done that, that displeases you. And I thank you for dying for me, for wanting to illuminate my life, for wanting to comfort me, for wanting to set me free. God, I ask that you'd come into my heart right now or come back into my heart come back into my life. I want to surrender to you. I want you to be my savior. I don't want to hide from you anymore. I've been driving on this road, this dark road by myself for too long. I need you to guide me. I need you to lead me to life. And Jesus responds saying yes, saying yes, welcome home, welcome home. You never have to be alone again. You never have to be in the dark for too long. You don't have to try and deal with these things on your own. I'm here with you. Thank you, Jesus. We're gonna worship for a few more minutes. And as we're worshiping, I want you to let the presence of God comfort you and start to light up your world. We'll see you again next week in a, in a little bit after worship. Uh, Micah will be back to let us know uh, what we can do to, 
take our next steps. I'm Missy Gateway. Love you. Hope to see you soon.